From John F. Kennedy's connection with the Chicago outfit to Donald Trump's alleged past connection with organized crime, we delve into the murky and dark world of politics where power is often in an inseparable romance with corruption. Sit back as we unravel the shocking stories of 10 corrupted politicians who work with the mafia, which will leave questioning the very fabric of the world's politics. Donald Trump, from his shady casino deals to contradictory statements and associations with known mobsters, former U.S. President Donald Trump's past is riddled with questionable connections. In the early 1980s, Donald Trump set his sights on Atlantic City, New Jersey, as the perfect location to establish his casino empire. Little did the public know that behind the glitz and glamour of these casinos lay a web of connections to organized crime that would come back to haunt Trump later on. Trump's first major venture in Atlantic City involved leasing property from Kenneth Shapiro and Daniel Sullivan. Shapiro, as journalist Timothy L. O'Brien revealed in his book, Trump Nation, The Art of Being the Donald, was a street-level gangster with close ties to the Philadelphia mob. Sullivan, on the other hand, was a mafia associate, FBI informant, and labor negotiator. These were not the kind of individuals one would expect a reputable businessman to associate with. But Trump's ambition and desire for success seemed to outweigh any concerns about his partner's backgrounds. With the help of Shapiro and Sullivan, Trump began his casino empire in Atlantic City, starting with the construction of Trump Plaza. However, it wasn't just the shady connections of his business partners that raised eyebrows. Trump also had a run-in with the law during the construction of Trump Tower in Manhattan. He enlisted the help of a cement company controlled by mafia chieftains Anthony Fat Tony Salerno and Paul Castellano. This revelation came to light during a federal investigation, which concluded that the Trump Plaza apartment building, part of Trump's real estate empire, likely benefited from connections to racketeering. The construction industry in New York City was known to be saturated with mob influence, and Trump seemed to have no qualms about doing business with individuals tied to organized crime. This raised serious questions about his judgment and the extent of his connections. But the ties between Trump and the Mafia didn't end there. During the OE construction of Trump Tower, Trump encountered trouble with undocumented Polish workers who were demolishing the Bonwit Teller building to make way for his grand vision. To handle the situation, Trump turned to none other than Daniel Sullivan, his leasing partner in Atlantic City and a known Mafia associate. Sullivan's assistance in dealing with the Polish workers showcased Trump's willingness to work with individuals who had ties to organized crime. It also also raised concerns about the extent to which Trump was willing to compromise his principles for his business ventures. To add further intrigue to the story, Shapiro later testified before a federal grand jury that he had illegally funneled thousands of dollars to the Atlantic City mayor on Trump's behalf. Trump, of course, denied these allegations, but the fact that his leasing partner was involved in such activities raised serious questions about Trump's knowledge and involvement. Despite mounting evidence and allegations, Trump has consistently denied any association with individuals tied to the mafia. His ability to deflect investigations and limit scrutiny into his connections raises serious questions about his honesty and integrity. The efforts made to limit investigations and the extent of Trump's involvement with organized crime figures paint a troubling picture. From his ability to navigate the political landscape to his associations with notorious figures like Roy Cohn, Trump's story exposes the dark underbelly of his business dealings. As we wrap up this investigation, it becomes clear that the ties between Donald Trump and the Mafia cannot be ignored. The Inclusion of the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO, in his recent indictment, only adds to the resonance of his past connections. John F. Kennedy. Next, we delve into the barely believable tale of corruption and betrayal that intertwines the lives of the iconic U.S. President, John F. Kennedy, the world-renowned singer, Frank Sinatra, and the notorious underworld of organized crime. These two individuals, born into vastly different worlds, would eventually find themselves entangled in a web of fame, power, and organized crime. John F. Kennedy, born into a family of wealth and privilege, was groomed for high office from birth. His father, Joseph Kennedy, had amassed his fortune through stock market manipulation and bootlegging during the Prohibition era. Meanwhile, in the scrappy immigrant enclave of Hoboken, New Jersey, a young Frank Sinatra was growing up in a completely different world. His parents ran a bar called Marty O'Brien's, affectionately known as Mob for short. It was in this humble setting that Sinatra's journey to stardom would begin. Recognizing his exceptional singing talent as his ticket out of Hoboken, Sinatra established himself by performing in clubs owned by the Mafia. These venues became his stepping stones to success as he captivated audiences with his smooth voice and undeniable charisma. While Sinatra was making waves in the music industry, John F. Kennedy continued his political ascent. While it isn't clear what kickstarted their friendship, Sinatra and John F. Kennedy soon became close friends. It was well known that Kennedy was 
would take breaks between his campaigns to hang out with Sinatra, who welcomed him, a notorious philanderer, into an intoxicatingly cool world of exclusive parties and beautiful women. The photographs of these two impossibly famous men from supposedly separate worlds, seen palling around on club banquettes in a haze of whiskey and cigarettes, marked a public intersection of entertainment and politics that was rare at the time. Sinatra, dizzy with proximity to power, threw his full support behind Kennedy's presidential run in 1960. He not only released an awkward new version of his hit song High Hopes, with lyrics praising Kennedy, but also worked tirelessly behind the scenes, raising campaign funds and securing the support of the mafia, particularly the notoriously unstable Chicago outfit boss, Sam Giancana. The mafia, with its control over the unions, believed that their support for Kennedy would lead to a lenient administration. In return for helping Kennedy win, mobsters were led to believe that the new administration would go easy on them. Bobby Kennedy, appointed attorney general, shattered the informal agreement the mafia believed it had brokered. He set out to bring down the mob, leaving Sinatra and his mafia connections in a precarious position. As Bobby Kennedy's investigations intensified, it became clear that the mafia's position in the food chain was far from secure. The relationship between Sinatra and Kennedy also began to deteriorate. In 1962, with FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover on the president's tail, Kennedy's scheduled stay at Sinatra's California mansion, a visit for which the singer had proudly spent much time and money preparing, was abruptly canceled. The humiliated Sinatra was left with deep-seated resentment and insecurity. This turn of events marked a significant shift in Sinatra's political affiliation. Once a staunch Democrat and friend of the Kennedys, he now became a Republican. The betrayal he felt at the hands of his old pal Jack, the man who had partied with him in Vegas and was now the president, fueled his political transformation. Meanwhile, the Kennedys' ties with the Mafia would take a tragic turn. In 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, leaving a nation in shock and mourning. While not much is known about the cause of the murder, there is speculation it was a Mafia hit. It. The aftermath of Kennedy's assassination further exposed the fragile nature of the Kennedys' relationship with the Mafia, serving as a chilling reminder of the dark forces that lurked beneath the surface of American politics and showbiz. Joseph Esposito In the bustling streets of Chicago's Little Italy, a young Joseph Esposito was destined for a life of crime. Born on October 6, 1871, in Acera, Campania, Italy, Esposito immigrated to Illinois with his family in search of a better life. Little did they know that their son would become one of the most notorious figures in Chicago's criminal history. As a teenager, Esposito found himself drawn to the allure of the streets, joining a street gang that thrived in the neighborhood. When Prohibition swept across the nation in the 1920s, Esposito saw an opportunity to capitalize on the demand for illegal alcohol. He formed his own criminal organization, known as the 42 Gang, which quickly established itself as a force to be reckoned with in the bootlegging business. The 42 Gang, led by Esposito, popularly referred to as Diamond Joe, became a well-oiled machine smuggling alcohol into the city and distributing it to speakeasies and illegal bars. Their operations were shrouded in secrecy, with Esposito's cunning and strategic mind ensuring that law enforcement remained one step behind. While Joseph Esposito's criminal empire grew, so did his thirst for power. He recognized that to truly solidify his influence, he needed to extend his reach into the realm of politics. And so, he set his sights on becoming a Republican ward boss in the 19th Ward of Chicago. Through a combination of manipulation, bribery, and intimidation, Esposito maneuvered his way into the political arena. He became a master of backroom deals and forged alliances with influential figures, all while maintaining his ties to the mafia. Esposito's political power provided him with a unique advantage, the ability to protect and provide cover for the bootlegging gangs operating in Chicago's Italian communities. In exchange for their loyalty and financial support, he ensured that law enforcement turned a blind eye to their illegal activities. But it wasn't just the local mafia that Esposito aligned himself with. His ambitions led him to forge connections with some of the most notorious figures in organized crime, including his rival, Al Capone. Their relationship was one of both cooperation and competition, as they vied for control over the city's criminal enterprises. However, as Esposito's power and influence grew, so did the threats against him. Rival factions within the mafia, as well as law enforcement agencies, sought to bring him down. The line between politics and organized crime became increasingly blurred, and the consequences of his actions were catching up with him. In the late 1920s, the pressure on Esposito intensified. The federal government, under the leadership of Elliot Ness and his team of untouchables, launched a relentless campaign to dismantle the city's criminal organizations. Esposito found himself in the crosshairs of their investigation. But it wasn't just the law that posed a threat to Esposito. 
His rival, Al Capone, saw him as a hindrance to his own ambitions and sought to eliminate him. The tension between the two grew, and it was only a matter of time before violence erupted. On that fateful day of March 21st, 1928, Esposito was ambushed in a drive-by shooting. The assailants believed to be associated with Capone's gang unleashed a hail of bullets, ending Esposito's life in an instant. The news of Esposito's death sent shockwaves through the city. It marked the end of an era, a chapter in Chicago's history that was defined by corruption, power struggles, and the intertwining of politics and organized crime. Giulio Andreotti, Giulio Andreotti, the 41st Prime Minister of Italy, was a prominent figure in Italian politics, known for his diplomatic skills and ability to mediate conflicting interests within his party. However, his career was marred by allegations of colluding with the mafia, which led to criminal prosecutions and trials. Giulio Andreotti's political career began in the 1940s, and he quickly rose through the ranks of the Christian Democracy Party. Known for his mild-mannered demeanor, Attentive, memory, and sense of humor, Andriotti became a member of the National Council of the Christian Democracy Party in 1944. His early political achievements set the stage for his future prominence in Italian politics. In 1946, Andriotti was elected to the Constituent Assembly of Italy, where he served as Secretary of the Council of Ministers under Alcide de Gasperi. This position gave him wider ranging responsibilities than many full ministers, allowing him to make significant contributions to the reformation of the Italian. Olympic Committee and the establishment of import limits and screen quotas for Italian films. In 1972, Andriotti reached a significant milestone in his political career when he became Prime Minister for the first time. Leading two consecutive center-right cabinets, Andriotti's government focused on implementing social policies aimed at improving the lives of Italian citizens. One of his notable achievements during this period was the extension of health insurance and cost-of-living indexation to pension schemes, ensuring that the elderly and vulnerable population were provided for. While Andriotti's government prioritized domestic policies, he also played a crucial role in foreign affairs. He strengthened Italy's ties with NATO and Arab countries, contributing to Italy's position as a key player in international diplomacy. Andriotti's ability to navigate complex international relationships showcased his diplomatic skills and further solidified his reputation as a skilled statesman. Giulio Andriotti's political career was not without controversy, as he faced several legal challenges and allegations of colluding with the Mafia. These controversies would leave a lasting impact on his legacy and the Italian political landscape. In the mid-1990s, damaging accusations emerged that Andriotti had been involved with the Mafia, specifically Cosa Nostra. A string of Mafia informers claimed to prosecutors that Andriotti had been Cosa Nostra's protector in Rome and was known within the mob as Uncle Giulio. These allegations shook the foundations of Italian politics and cast a shadow over Andriotti's reputation. Andriotti was charged with having links to the Mafia and authorized the murder of journalist Mino Pecorelli, who had investigated his ties to Sicily's mobsters. The trials that followed were highly publicized and captured the attention of the nation. While Andriotti was acquitted of the murder charge in 2003, the judges in the other case ruled that there had been a concrete collaboration between Andriotti and the Mafia before 1980. They stated that his behavior had contributed to the reinforcement of Cosa Nostra, creating a feeling of protection among its members. During the period in which Andriotti was found to have had ties to the mob, he had headed no less than five Italian governments. However, due to the statute of limitations, he was not convicted or sentenced for the offenses of which he was accused. While Andriotti was acquitted of all charges, the controversies surrounding his alleged ties with the Mafia left a lasting stain on his reputation. Critics argued that the justice system had gone too far in prosecuting him while others believed that he had escaped true accountability for his actions, Zhou Yong Kong. Born into a humble family in eastern China, Zhou Yong Kong's journey to power was anything but ordinary. His father, an illiterate farmer, borrowed money to send Zhou to school, hoping for a better future for his son. Zhou's intelligence and hard work paid off, earning him a coveted spot at an elite university in Beijing, now known as China University of Petroleum. After graduating with a degree in oil exploration, Zhou embarked on a career that would shape his destiny. He was assigned to an oil field in the country's northeast, where he quickly rose through the ranks, showcasing his political savviness and leadership skills. It was during this time that Zhou's path would intersect with the state oil industry, which would later become one of his power bases. Zhou's political career gained momentum when he 
was transferred to the oil ministry in Beijing. This ministry would later transform into a giant state-owned oil company, providing Zhou with even more influence and power. In 2001, Zhou's political trajectory took another leap forward when he was appointed as the Communist Party chief of Sichuan province in southwest China. In 2002, he returned to Beijing and assumed control of the Ministry of Public Security, which oversaw the country's police forces. Five years later, Zhou's influence reached its peak when he secured a seat in the nine-member Politburo Standing Committee, China's top decision-making body. This elevated position granted him an expanded portfolio, covering all domestic security affairs. As Zhou Yongkang's power and influence grew, so did the rumors and whispers surrounding his alleged involvement in corruption and mafia ties. Behind the scenes, Zhou and his family members were reportedly taking advantage of his leadership position to accumulate enormous wealth through illicit means. For months, intense political rumors swirled around Zhou, casting a dark cloud over his once illustrious career. The Communist Party's disciplinary arm finally announced a formal investigation into Zhou for serious disciplinary violations, sending shockwaves through the political landscape. In December, the state-run Xinhua News Agency reported Zhou's arrest after the Communist leadership expelled him from the party. The once powerful security chief now found himself on the wrong side of the law, facing a litany of charges that would rock the nation. State prosecutors revealed that Zhou had been formally charged with accepting bribes, abuse of power, and leaking state secrets, allegations that would send shockwaves through the Chinese public. The subsequent criminal trial held in Tianjin, a city near Beijing, would be a defining moment in Zhou's life. Zhou, now 72 years old, faced a life sentence for taking bribes, along with additional years for abusing power and revealing state secrets. But the allegations didn't stop there. Party investigators accused Zhou of having affairs with multiple women and trading power and money for sex, further tarnishing his reputation and shocking the nation. He was also accused of having affiliation with organized crime, especially as his close associate, Chinese billionaire Liu Han, was found guilty of running a mafia-style gang. The trial exposed the extent of Zhou's alleged corruption and abuse of power, leaving no doubt that he had abused his position for personal gain. The story of Zhou Yongkang serves as a cautionary tale, highlighting the dangers of unchecked power and consequences of succumbing to corruption. It is a reminder that even the most most powerful figures can be brought down by their own greed and illicit activities. Silvio Berlusconi Next, we delve into the scandalous world of Silvio Berlusconi, the former Prime Minister of Italy and a prominent figure in Italian politics. Known for his charismatic personality and media empire, Berlusconi's career has been marred by controversy and allegations of corruption. However, one of the most shocking aspects of his political journey is his alleged mafia ties. Born on September 29, 1936 in Milan, Italy, Silvio Berlusconi grew up in a middle-class family. From a young age, he showed a keen interest in business and entrepreneurship. In the 1960s, Berlusconi ventured into the world of media, establishing his own television network, Mediaset. This marked the beginning of his media empire, which would later play a significant role in his political ambitions. In 1994, Berlusconi founded his own political party, Forza Italia, which aimed to challenge the established political order in Italy. Riding on a wave of populism and anti-establishment sentiment, Berlusconi presented himself as a successful businessman who could bring prosperity and stability to the country. That same year, Forza Italia won a significant number of seats in the Italian parliament, propelling him into the national spotlight. He formed a coalition government with other right-wing parties, becoming the prime minister of Italy for the first time. As Berlusconi's political career progressed, so did the controversies surrounding him. Allegations of corruption, bribery, and abuse of power plagued his tenure as prime minister. His opponents accused him of using his political position to protect his own interests and avoid legal repercussions. The first whispers of Berlusconi's alleged mafia ties emerged during the 1990s, a tumultuous time in Italy when the mafia was at war with the Italian state. It was a period marked by the brutal assassinations of two high-profile judges, Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino, who were revered in Sicily for their relentless fight against organized crime. Alessandro Di Battista, a top official in the Five Star Movement, recently revived these accusations, citing a court ruling against Marcello Dell'Utri, a former former longtime aide to Berlusconi and the founder of Forza Italia. Delutri is currently serving time in jail due to his ties to the Cosa Nostra, the Sicilian Mafia. The allegations against Berlusconi's ties to organized crime gained traction when it was revealed that he had hired a Mafia associate as a gardener and stableman at his villa. This shocking revelation raised eyebrows and fueled speculation about the extent of Berlusconi's involvement with the Mafia, maintaining that he has no ties to organized crime. However, his close association with Del Utri, who is now 
now considered an ambassador to the Cosa Nostra, has raised suspicions and fueled public outrage. It is worth noting that Del Utri was not only a longtime business associate of Berlusconi, but also played a significant role in guiding his entry into politics. This connection has further fueled speculation about the nature of their relationship and the extent of Berlusconi's knowledge about Del Utri's ties to the Mafia. Despite the controversy surrounding Berlusconi's alleged Mafia ties, it is important to note that he has never been tried on charges relating to the Cosa Nostra. However, several Mafia turncoats have made claims about his connections with the Sicilian criminal organization, adding fuel to the fire of speculation. Marcello Del Utri Born and raised in Sicily, Marcello Del Utri had always been ambitious. He possessed a keen intellect and a drive to succeed. It was during his time at university that Del Utri first crossed paths with Silvio Berlusconi, a charismatic and influential figure who would become his mentor and confidant. Berlusconi, already a successful businessman, recognized Del Utri's potential and took him under his wing. As Berlusconi's media empire grew, Del Utri played a crucial role in its expansion. He ran Berlusconi's advertising agency, crafting campaigns that would captivate the Italian public and solidify Berlusconi's influence in the media landscape. However, their partnership extended far beyond the world of advertising. Del Utri became Berlusconi's right-hand man in the political arena, helping him navigate the complex world of Italian politics. Together, they founded the conservative Forza Italia Party, a force that would shake the foundations of the Italian political landscape. Del Utri's strategic mind and political acumen were instrumental in Forza Italia's success. He orchestrated campaigns mobilized supporters, and ensured that Berlusconi's message resonated with the masses. But behind the scenes, a darker side to Del Utri's rise to power was beginning to emerge. Unbeknownst to the public, he had forged deep connections with the Sicilian Mafia, acting as a go-between for the criminal underworld and the Milan business elite, including Berlusconi's companies. All of this would later be revealed during his trial following investigations into the claims of his association with the Mafia. The evidence painted a vivid picture of Del Utri's role as a facilitator and intermediary, linking the Sicilian Mafia. It was a web of corruption and collusion that spanned decades, implicating both Del Utri and his close associate, Silvio Berlusconi. As Marcello, Del Utri's trial unfolded in the city of Palermo. Prosecutors presented a wealth of shocking evidence that would expose the extent of his ties with the Sicilian Mafia. This evidence, ranging from intercepted phone conversations to financial records and testimonies from former mob members, painted a damning picture of Del Utri's involvement in criminal activities. But perhaps the most compelling evidence came in the form of testimonies from former mob members. These individuals, who had once been part of the Sicilian Mafia, provided first-hand accounts of Del Utri's role as a facilitator and intermediary. Their testimonies painted a vivid picture of Del Utri's deep connections with the criminal underworld. The former mob members described Del Utri as a trusted associate, someone who had earned the respect and trust of the Sicilian Mafia. They spoke of secret meetings, clandestine transactions, and the influence Del Utri wielded within the Milan business world. Their testimonies left no doubt about Del Utri's involvement in organized crime. Despite the overwhelming evidence presented during the trial, Del Utri maintained his innocence, claiming that he was the victim of a politically motivated prosecution. He portrayed himself as a scapegoat caught in the crossfire of a larger political battle. However, the weight of the evidence and the testimonies from former mob members proved too substantial to ignore. In 2014, Delutri was found guilty of acting as a go-between for the Sicilian Mafia and the Milan business elite. He was sentenced to nine years in prison, a verdict that sent shockwaves through the nation. The conviction marked a turning point in Italy's fight against organized crime. It exposed the deep-rooted connections between the mafia and the political and business elite, forcing the nation to confront the uncomfortable truth that corruption and collusion were not confined to the shadows but had infiltrated the highest levels of power. Jim Traficon Before he arrived in Congress, Jim Traficon had already made a name for himself in the gritty city of Youngstown, Ohio. Known as Murder City, USA, Youngstown had long been under the grip of the mafia, with dead bodies dumped into the nearby Meander Reservoir. The mob's influence extended to the police department and the politicians leaving few untainted by their control. But Traficant, a former college football star and local drug counselor, was determined to challenge their power. In 1980, Traficant decided to run for sheriff in the Democratic primary, taking on the incumbent who was known to have close ties with the Mafia. Little did he know that his path would lead him into a dangerous dance with organized crime figures. During his campaign, Traficant's cousin, a Las Vegas gambler, introduced him to Charles Carabia, a rough and intimidating figure with ties to the Cleveland Syndicate. Carabia 
media offered to raise money for Traficant's campaign, hedging the mob's bets in case the popular Traficant upset the incumbent. Recognizing the corrupt nature of the offer, Traficant saw an opportunity to use their money against them in the future. With Carabia's help, Traficant raised a substantial sum of $103,000 for his campaign. But as the primary election drew near, Carabia revealed his true intentions. He wanted Traficant to meet James Prado, the boss of the Pittsburgh mob-aligned faction in Youngstown. Prado was a formidable figure, and Carabia believed that Traficant could use his influence to take down Prado. Reluctantly, Traficant agreed to the meeting. Carabia took him to Prado's restaurant, the Calamar Manor in Youngstown, where a brief conversation ensued. To Traficant's surprise, Prado handed him an envelope containing $55,000 in cash. The offer was clear. The money was meant to secure Traficant's loyalty. But Traficant, true to his principles, made a decision that would change the course of his political career. That same night, Traficant met with Carabia again and returned the envelope and all the cash. He told Carabia to give the money back to Prato, refusing to be bought or compromised. This act of defiance shocked Carabia, who had never encountered a politician who would refuse money from the mob. Traficant's refusal to play by their rules set him on a collision course with the powerful forces that controlled Youngstown. In a landslide victory, Traficant secured the Democratic nomination for sheriff, defying the odds and the expectations of the mob. But little did he know that his refusal to be swayed by their money would have far-reaching consequences. Soon after his victory, Traficant found himself facing a new challenge. The FBI received a report from his Republican opponent in the general election, alleging that he had been approached by local mobsters who offered cash in return for not interfering with their criminal operations. These allegations cast a shadow over Traficant's campaign and raised questions about his integrity. The FBI began investigating Traficant's ties to organized crime, and in a shocking turn of events, he was indicted on federal charges of racketeering, conspiracy to commit bribery, and taking illegal gratuities. The allegations were a blow to Traficant's reputation, but he remained steadfast in his innocence. Undeterred by the charges, Traficant decided to take on his legal battle himself, acting as his own lawyer during the trial. It was a risky move for someone with no legal training, but Traficant was determined to prove his innocence and expose the corruption that plagued his city. The trial became a spectacle, capturing the attention of the nation. Traficant's unconventional style and street-tough demeanor made him a captivating figure in the courtroom. He passionately defended himself, arguing that he had not accepted bribes but had used the mob's money as part of his own counter-sting operation against them. Whether or not this was entirely true, Traficant achieved the seemingly impossible. He convinced the jury that he was not taking payoffs at all, but conducting his own counter-sting operation. The verdict was a stunning victory for Traficant, solidifying his reputation as the Teflon congressman who could escape any charges thrown his way. Still, his name would always be associated with the mafia, whether or not he was able to prove his innocence in a court of law. Hashim Thatsi. In the late 1980s, tensions between the ethnic Albanian majority and the Serbian government escalated, leading to a crackdown on Kosovo's autonomy. Hashim Thatsi, like many others, became involved in the resistance movement, joining the Kosovo Liberation Army, KL. The KLA, initially formed as a guerrilla force, aimed to fight for the independence of Kosovo from Serbia. Thotsi quickly rose through the ranks of the KLA, displaying leadership skills and a fierce determination to achieve their goals. He became a prominent figure within the organization, known for his charisma and ability to rally support. The turning point for Thasi and the KLA came in 1999, when NATO intervened in the Kosovo War. The Serbian forces, led by Slobodan Milosevic, had unleashed a campaign of ethnic cleansing targeting Albanians in Kosovo. NATO's intervention helped put an end to the atrocities committed by the Serbian forces and paved the way for Kosovo's independence. Following the war, Thasi transitioned from a military leader to a political figure. In 2000, he became the political leader of the KLA and played a crucial role in the establishment of the new government in Kosovo. His rise to power was met with both admiration and skepticism as whispers of his alleged ties to organized crime began to circulate. It was in the fall of 2000 that the first known NATO military military intelligence report on local organized crime implicated Thasi. The report highlighted his influence over criminal organizations that controlled a significant part of Kosovo. The Council of Europe's human rights rapporteur, Dick Marty, conducted an official inquiry into these allegations. In his report, Marty accused Thasi and several other senior figures from the KLA of having ties to organized crime. These shocking revelations sent shockwaves through the international community, prompting calls for criminal investigations into Thasi's alleged criminal network.
network. Despite the mounting evidence and allegations, Thaisi's government has vehemently dismissed the Marty report as part of a Serbian and Russian conspiracy to destabilize Kosovo. However, leaked documents from KFOR, the NATO-led peacekeeping force responsible for security in Kosovo, further support the claims against Thasi. These documents, produced around 2004, identify Thasi as one of the biggest fish in organized criminal circles. The reports indicate that Thasi was the head of a mafia-like network responsible for smuggling weapons during and after the 1998-99 Kosovo War. This revelation raises serious concerns about the extent of his influence and the role he played in fueling the conflict. But the allegations against Thasi don't stop there. The reports also accuse him of exerting violent control over the heroin trade, further solidifying his alleged ties to organized crime. Perhaps the most shocking claim made in the reports is the involvement of Thasi's inner circle in a gang that murdered Serb captives to sell their kidneys on the black market. This gruesome operation highlights the depths of depravity that Thasi and his associates are alleged to have sunk into. The human organ trafficking allegations have sent shockwaves through the international community, demanding immediate attention and action. The potential implications of these investigations are far-reaching, with the consequences for Thasi and his associates potentially severe if found guilty. The aftermath of these revelations will undoubtedly shape the future of Kosovo and raise important questions about the integrity of those in power. Nicola Mancino Born in Italy in the 1950s, Nicola Mancino began his political career in the turbulent landscape of Italian politics. With a charismatic demeanor and a knack for navigating the complex world of power, Mancino quickly climbed the ranks, holding various high-ranking positions within the Italian government. As he ascended the political ladder, Mancino gained a reputation for his ability to forge alliances and build connections. His charm and political acumen made him a force to be reckoned with, and he soon became a prominent figure in Italian politics. Mancino's rise to power was not without controversy. Rumors of backroom deals and questionable alliances swirled around him, but he always managed to maintain an air of respectability. It seemed as though nothing could tarnish his carefully crafted image. But behind closed doors, a different side of Mancino began to emerge, a side that would shock the nation and reveal his deep ties to the Sicilian Mafia. It is within this context that the scandal surrounding Mancino's affiliation with the Mafia comes to light. In July 2012, prosecutors in Palermo accused him of withholding crucial evidence about negotiations between the state and the Cosa Nostra, the Sicilian Mafia. These negotiations aimed to end a series of bombings carried out by the Cosa Nostra in 1992. It was the early 1990s, a time when Italy was plagued by a wave of bombings orchestrated by the Cosa Nostra, the notorious Sicilian Mafia. These bombings resulted in the deaths of anti-Mafia prosecutors and innocent civilians, leaving the nation in a state of fear and chaos. Desperate to put an end to the violence, the Italian government engaged in secret negotiations with the Mafia, and at the center of these negotiations was Nicola Mancino, the former interior minister. The allegations against Mancino were nothing short of shocking. It is believed that he struck deals with the Mafia to halt the bombings and prevent the murder of anti-Mafia magistrates. But what did the Mafia gain in return? The Mafia sought relaxed prison sentences for their jailed members. It was a sinister trade-off where the government's duty to uphold justice seemed to be compromised for the sake of temporary peace. The trial, held in a secret bunker courthouse near Palermo, became a spectacle like no other. With a staggering 1,788 witnesses coming forth to give their testimony, it seemed like there was no way Mancino was going to beat the allegations. The nation, on the other hand, grappled with the realization that one of its trusted leaders had been entangled in a web of corruption and deceit. The implications of Mancino's affiliation with the Mafia extended far beyond his reputation. The trial exposed a deep-rooted problem within the Italian government, where the lines between politics and organized crime become blurred. Although he was acquitted on the 20th of April 2018, the trial had already left a blight on Mancino's reputation. His involvement with the Mafia serves as a stark reminder that the Mafia's reach extends far beyond the shadows, and their influence can corrupt even the most powerful institutions. This video of 10 corrupted politicians who work with the Mafia shows that the saying absolute power corrupts absolutely is nothing but the truth, and in the political world, people would do anything to gain power. For more enlightening videos like this, click on the cards showing on your screens and I'll be waiting on the other side.